Markus Meckel. Ich bin der neue Vorsitzende der Deutsch-Belarussischen Gesellschaft in der Nachfolge von Rainer Lindner und freue mich, Sie hier begrüßen zu können. Ich freue mich, dass wir dies in Zusammenarbeit mit der DGO machen können und dass wir die schwierige Lage in Belarus zum Thema machen, sowohl in der Hinsicht der Corona-Situation, die ja dort sehr speziell behandelt wird, als auch im Blick auf die kommenden Präsidentschaftswahlen. Ich wünsche uns eine gute Runde, bessere Einblicke und hoffe, dass wir alle miteinander etwas lernen voneinander. Herzlichen Dank allen und ich gebe weiter an Gabriele Forster. Ja, vielen Dank, äh, Markus Mecke, für die Kooperation. With this, I switch to English to welcome okay. everyone here. I'm very glad about this cooperation of the German Belarusian Society and the German Association for East European Studies. My name is Gabriele Freitag. And uh, as you know, the upcoming presidential elections have mobilized people within Belarus and outside of Belarus on an unprecedented scale. And several factors seem to be decisive for this, a growing discontent of the population in Belarus with the current political situation, most probably also due to the mismanagement, or I should say, lack of any kind of management of the pending corona crisis, also combined with an increase of self-organization of the population in Belarus and also outside, while simultaneously there seems to be a growing gap between hardliners and more compromise-oriented figures within the political establishment. And also very interestingly, a new, well, new promising candidate suggests that a new opposition stratum comes to the fore. And personally, I should say, this reminds me, and I suppose it reminds a lot of you of the election campaigns back in 2010. And DGO then also organized uh, several panel discussions We all talked about this kind of wind of change. We even invited candidates, uh, then presidential candidates, uh, Andrei Tsarnikov and Yaroslav Romanchuk were then in Berlin. And I think the sharp differences between 2010 and today are that back then, the Belarusian government brutally crushed protests directly after the elections, while now any form of opposition is already crushed by the regime prior to the election. So I think therefore it is very, very important that we have a closer look at what is going on in Belarus right now. And this is why I'm very happy that DGO is co-hosting this event and I'm very grateful to the German Belarusian Society for taking the initiative and for inviting us as co-hosts. And let me make some technical remarks. This web seminar is recorded. And if you want to participate in the discussion, you can send us questions via the button Q&A or F&A, questions and answers, Fragen und Antworten. You see the icon on the bottom of your screen. And just send us your questions either already during the panel discussion with which we start or afterwards when questions from the audience will be read out. And if you would rather not have your name mentioned, you can use the button ask questions anonymously. So it's up to you. And with this, I hand over to Olga Drindova today's chair of the discussion. Olga is editor of the online Belarus Analysen, Belarus Analysis, and she is deputy chair of the German Belarusian Society. Olga, thanks a lot, and the word is to you. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, our speakers, and thank you very much, um, our guests. I'm impressed. I've just uh, got information today that we um, Uh, have about, well, between 60 and 70 uh, registrations for this webinar. Thank you very much for your high interest in discussion. Thank you very much for your interest um, to politics in Belarus. Um, 
I would like maybe our speakers to turn off the mic so that we don't have any echo. Thank you. Uh, so before starting the discussion, I want to show just a short video um, that has, uh, for me personally, become a kind of um, well, a kind of a symbol of the spring of Belarus. The video depicts um, very long queues uh, um, of Belarusians um, throughout the country uh, who were waiting to sign for alternative um, presiden presidential candidacies. And such a political activity um, during electoral campaign is actually, well, has not been seen for, for, for ages, maybe even for decades. Uh, so just to give you a short impression, just in case um, somebody of you has not seen it yet, I'm about to share my screen and I hope it will function. Can you see that? Can somebody tell me if, if the screen is shared? Hello? Yes, yeah, so we can see. Okay. Okay, those were some impressions from the um, uh, Belarusian regions and from the capital during the last uh, four weeks, well, uh, the middle of May till the middle of June. Uh, we can say that um, Belarus unexpectedly became um, a kind of a political reality show for both Belarusian and international public. Um, we uh, could see... Uh, we could see um, active citizens who actually represented social circles far beyond the classical opposition. It's one of the interesting tendencies of this presidential um, uh, campaign. Uh, we also saw um, uh, unprecedented long queues for people uh, who were ready to sign for anybody but Lukashenko. Um, I think we still have one guest who has not turned off his mic. Marcos, can you hear me? Yes. Can you please turn off your mic? Is it? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, who are ready to sign for anybody but Lukashenko, um, both in capital and in the Belarusian regions. And this regional scape is also kind of very, very interesting tendency of this um, campaign. And we've heard very emotional appeals of people uh, asking on camera, um, not being afraid to ask the president on camera to leave his post after 26 years of being in power. Um, and then solidarity changed in many cities after the detention of one of the most popular candidates, Viktor Babarika, who, um, well, um, is, is considered to be, well, we don't have any social, we don't have any polls, but uh, he is considered to be um, one of the most popular candidates, potential candidates in this election. And if we add to the fact that the um, two popular candidates are actually uh, former high profile regime performers, um, it could put a smooth re-election of the incumbent president um, on the 9th of um, August into question. And that is actually why we're here today. 
uh, we decided to focus on, on during our discussion on two dimensions the social dimension so that to understand who those people are why are they protesting uh, why um, have they become that active and of course also the elites because we see the new faces in the Belarusian politics uh, they uh, it was not um, expected that we would see them so uh, we have uh, two excellent guests today with us to cover those two issues. Um, I'm happy to introduce um, uh, Rehor Astapenia. Rehor is a Robert Bosch uh, Stiftung Academy Fellow at Chatham House in London, and he's a research director of uh, Center for New Ideas. It's um, um, a think tank based in Minsk in Belarus. And Rehor received his PhD in political science at the University of Warsaw. And I'm also happy to introduce Alexander Heresimenko. Alexander completed his PhD dissertation at the University of Westminster, and he's now involved in a computational uh, propaganda project at the University of Oxford. Uh, his dissertation investigated um, how digital uh, dissidents in authoritarian states with a focus on Russia and Belarus uh, used actually use social media to um, organize people and to disseminate information. So there are two areas of expertise that we will meet uh, today for our discussion. Thank you very much that you found time to be with us today. Um, uh, we will have some rounds of questions to both of the speakers and uh, uh, dear guests. Um, uh, as uh, Gabriela um, already mentioned, you have this question and answers um possibility you can already start asking your questions also during the discussion so you don't have to wait till the end and we'll have about um 20 25 minutes time and of course we'll we'll do our best um to 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 take all the questions that you send us or at least most of them okay uh we'll start with the questions and the first question will go to alexander Alexander, um, at latest, since the beginning of May, one has been talking about an unexpected politicization of the Belarusian society. We already mentioned that. Um, what do you think are the main reasons uh, for such a political activity of people in Belarus? Um, do you think, um, maybe you could give us a picture of who actually those people are? Uh, what social groups do they represent? Uh, why do they want to protest? And maybe we're even talking about various social groups uh, who might have different reasons for protests but still uh, kind of um, find themselves uh, at one time and at one place so what what is actually the nature of this protest so um, the mic is yours it would be great if you uh, could answer within five to seven minutes thank you uh okay yeah all right thank you hi everyone thank you for inviting uh, yeah, so basically, indeed, as, as uh, Volga just mentioned, we observed this quite huge wave of politicization of Belarusian society. And this is what, in my opinion, goes against many uh, goals of any authoritarian regime that normally tries to depoliticize people's society, to remove them from politics, to leave politics only for elites for selected uh, circles around the leaders and this time as well as actually every five years when we have some opportunity for presidential campaigning uh, something starts happening in belarus and this time we observe indeed a growing protest movement which is of course uh, as usually in those cases in authoritarian countries protest movement described as unexpected, spontaneous, though I'm not really sure if it's spontaneous, but it's definitely not very much, and it's not very much expected. So what, in terms of reasons for its emergence and reasons for the growth of this politicization, I would highlight, I would highlight um, three of them. So I think there are three factors uh, that facilitate the emergence of this new protest movement. The first reason I think is factor I mentioned, presidential elections, which is also a biggest opportunity for political activists to somehow influence situation, to mobilize new people and to reach wider audiences. So this time uh, what's been happening, I think, is that uh, this time uh, 
this opportunity to reach wider audiences, wider social classes, been facilitated by the growing, uh, by the growth of some sort of some kind of uh, public sphere on social media, a growing importance of social media as a place for political discussion in a highly censored media environment in Belarus. And the key platform, key social media that this time facilitates uh, the emergence of this online public sphere is, I think, YouTube. So YouTube is second most popular digital platform in Belarus, as well as across the world. In that case, we are not very different. But this time what happened is, is the growing importance of YouTube as, as a platform for expression of political opinion. We observed emergence of dozens of absolutely quite new people who talk about politics in a very simple way. I would say using populist terms and ideas, but the way how they talk really appeals to many, many people. So we have political bloggers in Belarus who has uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And these numbers are growing so rapidly. So when campaign started, they had uh, maybe 100,000 subscribers, 200. These days they had 300,000 subscribers. And it's for the audience, the whole audience of internet in Belarus might be six, seven million people. So huge numbers of people watching those people. And one of them, one of those bloggers actually is running, or in fact, his wife is running for, uh, for president for, in this campaign. Uh, so I think we observed this emergence of this uh, huge uh, kind of interest in politics and this interest is facilitated by uh, social media. And it's first time for Belarus when social media plays such a huge role in, in politics. Second factor is context. And the context is, of course, also world phenomena, pandemic COVID-19 uh, story. This is also very much influential across the world. Many protest movements emerged across the world that that been uh, triggered by COVID. At least 15 to 20 countries saw this emergence of this type of uh, protest movements. In Belarus, the context is, of course, that COVID-19 been managed very differently from most of the world. Uh, government adopted very unusual stance on COVID. It essentially didn't really introduce any lockdown measures. It didn't really sometimes recognize many important risks of COVID. And moreover, it definitely manipulated with COVID statistics. And this perhaps what triggered emotional reaction of people. People didn't like this response. They've been feared for their security, for their safety related to COVID. And this contributed, this context contributed to, their, to, the, to the emergence of this emotional response. Uh, and the final factor I think is of course, um, is of course the measures taken by the government, by the regime at the very beginning of this campaign. So uh, Vitaly Selitsky, great Belarusian political scientist has the theory uh, category for Belarusian regime he was calling it preventive authoritarianism. And I think uh, this time, it seems like the idea of preventive authoritarianism is that regime prevents any risks, any dangers to it in advance, sends many opponents to the prison, uh, imposes other restrictive measures, uh, imposes restrictions on, on freedom of movement, freedom, or sorry, freedom of association, and this is really restricts many activities, uh, civic activities. This time, regime was slow in their reaction. It was very slow. And one of the reasons for this, um, and this concluding perhaps thought I have, is that it seems like um, the regime were not really ready to anticipate the quick emergence of uh, this type of new type of network movement, a movement that is based not in the capital as usual, but rather spread across the, the country. And it's been facilitated not by usual political leaders, not the, by the opposition, but by some kind of different people, previously unknown to them. But now I think regime is responding quite rapidly. We know that a couple of important bloggers and administrators of important influential social media pages and groups have been isolated in, in detention centers. So it seems it started responding, but it was late. And this la lateness really affected the, gave opportunity for movement to grow. 
this is my answer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alice. Um, and just um, to summarize it a bit once again, so the first one is the role of social media, the second one is the uh, general context of COVID, um, of the pandemic, and the second one, um, we have new faces, we have different people in politics, and the authorities didn't have time um, to, to react on that, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go further uh, with the next question to uh, Rehor about um, um, the Belarusian elites. It's uh, um, actually a very important question and very rarely discussed here in Germany because we don't have um, we don't have much information on that. We don't have a lot of speakers uh, who can tell us uh, who actually the Belarusian elites are. So who are we talking about when we speak about Belarusian elites? And I know, Rehor, you have been researching Belarusian elites in Chatham House for um, some time already. So, um, and we see that for the first time, for the first time in many years, um, we have um, uh, former high profile regime performers taking part in the electoral campaign. These people actually, at least two of them, well, two of them are actually um, seem to be very popular um, in the Belarusian society. So um, maybe you could, um, in the first part um, of your uh, input, tell us a bit about the nature of the Belarusian elites, who these people are, and then of course then connect um, connect your knowledge to the situation that we have now. So who these people are, who, who is Mr. Babarika, who is Mr. Tipkala, the ex-head of the tech park and the ex-head of Belgas from Bank. What is their motivation uh, to take part in elections? Do you have the, there is somebody, do, do, do you think there is um, somebody who is standing behind them? Because the, we, have, we have heard some speculations on the role of Russian factor uh, in the campaign of Babarika, for example. And um, what do you think, what impact their participation um, and also this bottom-up pressure that comes from society uh, can have on the unity of the political elite? So do you actually see any processes there happening within the elites or is it a bit too early to speak about that? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Before I say how the election influences the unity, of the ruling class, I have to talk about Belarusian elites more generally. When Lukashenko assumed his power, like 26 years ago, he subordinated the elites to his political will. But despite that, it's important to know that actually the Belarusian ruling class is formed by people with different ideas and with different preferences. Moreover, when Lukashenko feels safe, he can even grant high positions to people whose thinking is different from his own. A decade ago, it wasn't easy to imagine that the Belarusian prime minister could hold liberal economic views as it was in case of Sergei Rumas. It was difficult to imagine that the head of the National Bank would be a man who opposes Lukashenko's macroeconomic ideas. So within the Belarusian political system, we can find different people and with different views about changes. Inside the system, some people would like mass repressions. Some people would like liberal economic reforms. Some wish Belarus to be less dependent on Russia. Some of them are more pro-Russian. Many, and, no, and probably even majority, want just nothing but their salaries. So within the system, there are different people with different attitudes towards Lukashenko. Therefore, the fact that Valery Tsapkala come from the political elite to their position to become an opposition politician or people like Viktor Babarika come from the economic elite to become an opposition politician. These facts actually shouldn't be a surprise because instead probably a question is why there are actually so few people challenging Lukashenko from different parts of the Belarusian elite. Well now I probably should say a little bit more about Babarika and Tsapkala well, although Lukashenko often accuses uh, Babarika, who was the head of the Belarusian branch of Gazprom Bank, of being a puppet of Gazprom of Russia, so far there are no proofs of that. And I do not see any people behind Babarika and Tsipkala. Babarika is a pretty rich person who was always criticizing the regime. Case of Valery Tsipkala is quite different because he was a regime insider. He was the creator, he is the, cr the creator of the Belarusian high-tech park, which is basically an economic zone with preferential 
tax conditions for IT companies. So, and it is the only economic success the Russian authorities had in the last 10 years. So when, for example, foreign politicians like Mike Pompeo, or for example, when German members of parliament came to Belarus this year, they visited high tech park because actually there are not so many successful and ambitious places in Minsk to visit. So when Tsipkala was fired three years ago from his position, he felt offended because he thinks that he's actually a person who should be thanked for having this high tech park miracle, miracle in Belarus. The second thing to know about Belarusian elites is that almost all of them have built their careers during Lukashenko's reign and they served exclusively, almost all of them, under his presidency. So they are led with initiative, loyalty to existing rule, and unwill unwillingness to openly express their views. And mutual mistrust actually result from the conditions in which they were socialized. The Russian officials treat Lukashenko as a constant, assuming that loyalty, absolute loyalty to him, is a condition of staying in power. So majority of the Belarusian ruling class just cannot imagine themselves challenging Lukashenko. That is why although Belarusian elites know about bottom-up bottom pressure from Belarusian society, it's still insignificant, insignificant for them compared with the pressure from the top, from the, from the presidential administration, from the KGP. So, and also by the end of the day, they do not see any theory of change that will explain why that actually they should ex oppose Lukashenko now. The third thing I should mention is finally to respond to the question, how does the election influence the unity of the political elite? First, the election has led to the fact that the system got rid of those people who Lukashenko thinks are too liberal and whose vision seems closer to views, for example, of Viktor Babarika than Alexander Lukashenko. For example, a month ago, Prime Minister Sergei Rumas and Finance Minister Maxim Rebalovich lost their positions. Some other more or less liberal Belarusian officials probably have to consider or a possibility of a similar path. Second, because of the election, the security agencies gained more weight in the system, although the, their role was huge even before the election. And now massive repressions seem inevitable, unavoidable. And even if you look, for example, at the foreign minister, Vladimir Mackey, he seems that he already accepted the fact that many years of his work will be wasted. His statements essentially repeat lies that the representatives of the security agencies say. Well, um, to summarize this part, because of the election, the system has become more ideologically limited and more firm inside. Now, Belarusian elite right now is actually a ruling class of the wartime. And the only question is that the security agencies actually cannot run the economy. So I guess that a return to some kind of normalcy after the election is very likely. Thank you. Thank you very much for this good insight. Um, now we'll get back to the um, to our social focus of discussion. And um, I would like to repeat actually uh, one of the parts of the previous question to you, um, Alice, because I think um, uh, you um, have not really mentioned that. So you focus on the um, reasons, um, mainly reasons of the protests. Um, but we still, I think our public, our speak, um, our guests also want to know who actually these people are. Maybe you could um, explain us a bit more. Do you see it's a, it's a one united social group that is kind of tired of the president and wants to have some changes? Or do you, do, do you see that the electorate of uh, Babarika Tsepkala Tikhanovsky, the YouTube blogger, do you see that these people belong actually to different uh, social groups, but are still kind of um, united in their protests against the president. So 
uh, could you give us a picture, maybe a picture of a social picture of, of these people who are protesting? And the second part, uh, you have already kind of partly answered this question about the role of social media. You have researched in the influence of social media on the protests in Russia and Belarus. Um, how would you estimate, you already mentioned uh, that YouTube plays a very important role. We also know that Telegram channels um, uh, has now, have now become important um, in all these grassroots movements, protests in Belarus. Uh, uh, there are a lot of local Telegram channels um, in Belarus right now. So how would you estimate the role of this uh, media now in Belarus? And do you actually see any similarities to the things that you researched in Russia? Maybe there is something that Belarusian people could, so to say, learn from the, uh, from the mistakes of their colleagues in Russia. So the first part is about who these people are, and the second part about the, um, uh, the similarities um, uh, in other mm -hmm. states um, in Russia that we maybe can transfer um, to the Belarusian society. Yeah, okay, thank you, yes. Uh, yeah, so who are those people who are protesting or who are not satisfied with the regime? I think there they were always people who were <laughs> not satisfied and but we don't really know much about demography of of any of any protest or any movement in belarus because uh, organizing a survey is extremely difficult and in fact now unlawful activity in a way so we don't really know much what 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 other observations suggest or uh, differences between say uh, the previous cycles of of electoral protest movement emergence that we observed in 2010, 2006, 2001, 2004 during the referendum was that this time, I think, uh, uh, protest of people who are not satisfied with uh, or oppose the regime, they, they are not just located in the capital or larger cities, but they're quite spread across the country. So they're, they're local population across very different places, regions. They might be poor and rich, they might be young and old, they might be educated and not very much educated. This is, might be a contrast to everything we saw previously over the last 20 years, but might be not that big contrast to, to the beginning of 90s in Belarus. Um, so I think that uh, while we don't know much, <laughs> I think that this time we observe quite large spectrum of all type of uh, categories of people who are not satisfied and who, who are ready to oppose the regime. And I think this is also partly related to uh, emotions associated with the context, with COVID. So essentially everyone who is unsatisfied with the regime's response to the COVID emergency uh, is a potential, a potential member of this protest movement. On the other hand, uh, what else we see in, 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 in this country is that, of course, uh, people, uh, this movement sometimes been called movement of 97% because there were some uh, fake polls spread, seems like uh, not, not proved polls that claiming that only 3% of the population supports uh, Lukashenko while 97 doesn't. Well, we never saw any proof for that, but <laughs> numbers might be not that far away from this. Uh, it seems like, but still it's, it's, it more looks like a manipulation to me. Yeah, so re re related to social media in Russia, I think uh, what we see now in Belarus or what we saw in Belarus Three years ago, if anyone remembers, there was another wave of protest related to this type of absurd tax on unemployment. Three years ago, we observed a kind of similar um, broad movement um, in 2007, 2000, uh, 2017, sorry, 2018. Uh, in Russia, there was quite large movement emerged, also related to presidential elections that was associated with the movement of Navalny. So this time, I think uh, those two, 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 two events are quite related to what we see now in Belarus. There are many factors, of course, that, um, that influence and affect uh, the dynamics uh, of, of the movement and uh, of the whole process. Um, and indeed, as you rightly mentioned, various new platforms like Telegram really, really influences. Uh, messengers first it, it, it just it seems like came to Belarus quite recently. Telegram became politically important just over the last year or two. In Russia, it was important quite a long time ago. I think what's happening now is that um, those platforms facilitate emergence 
of a very much segmented organization that is not really easily visible for, for, the, for, for the government, for police that normally monitors any type of protest activity. So it's harder to trace, it's harder to spot it, it's harder to understand who is really driving and organizing people. And that's those the puzzles that uh, the, the police tries to solve now in Belarus. And similar we saw in Russia. And I think what people who are now in, involved in this movement should think about is what gonna happen next after the election how they gonna preserve their movement, how they gonna um, try to keep those people who joined, uh, keep their interest in politics. Uh, and that's what I think Navalny movement in Russia was quite successful. We'll see what happens in Belarus this time. Um, thank you, it was a good final statement because uh, it's actually part of my next question and the last, uh, the last wave, um, uh, the last part of questions uh, that we have prepared for you today. I um, uh, would like to encourage our um, guests uh, to ask your questions. I think uh, you don't see all the questions as, as, as audience, but we already see we have a number of questions. Uh, so please uh, be free to do it if you already have something on mind. Okay, um, uh, the last question um, uh, goes to Rehor. Um, Rehor, the candidates for presidency, um, they have not been registered yet and we see they might be well denied registration. There are certain signs now coming from Belarus Well, quite a high percentage of signatures are um, not seen as legitimate. So it's not that good sign. And um, two out of three most popular figures have been uh, detained so far. And we've seen a wave of repressions against people who gathered signatures, against people who protested, um, against detentions um, of potential candidates and so on. Also against bloggers and journalists. Um, what do you think, Rohor? What I, I mean, it's really difficult now to, to make some predictions, and I do understand that it depends on other factors. But maybe you could give us some possible scenarios that you see the upcoming elections, and um, what influence can this election also, independently of this, uh, from these scenarios, can have on in the long run on the political system of Belarus? If you are, if you have this opinion that it could, and when yes, under which circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it seems that authorities already chose repressions as the main political tool for this campaign. And the question is, what will be the final scale of these repressions? On the one hand, they can be limited to hundreds of people arrested, uh, hundreds, and because, and uh, probably in Belarus will finish this election campaign with dozens of political prisoners uh, with criminal cases, as we already have now. Uh, on the other hand, so on the other hand, repressions can be much more massive and uh, we will see it just like in the months. In the long run, this campaign is very important because it showed that Lukashenko's electoral weakness that he is really, well, people joke about 3% right now that his electoral rate, rank, rating is through popularity is 3%, but it's actually high, of course, but it's still impossible for him to win in a fair competition. So what else we can see during this election that actually has no kind of program for Belarus. If you turn on Belarusian TV, you will notice that Lukashenko doesn't even give any promises. I think that now many people think that actually Belarus is wasting its time with Lukashenko. So I think this campaign was very important for to, to delegitimize uh, the authorities. That's why it's, this campaign is really unique compared with previous ones. And uh, it, this campaign also showed that there is a great demand for new opposition faces. And when they appear, they can become popular in a very short period of time. Uh, well, just to remind you, Babarika announced his plan to participate in the election just a week before the deadline to announce his candidacy. And he built a team just in a week. And after that, during the months, he collected almost half a million signatures. 
without significant financial resources. It's unbelievable for any European country. Uh, so now it's, of course, difficult to discuss prospects of Bobarika, Tikhanovsky, Tsipkala, uh, as two of them are already in prison, and the third one is likely to appear there as well. But this feeling in the society that Belarus needs new faces in politics, this feeling is not going anywhere. Thank you. Okay, so we are eager to hear what Alexander is thinking of the possible outcomes of elections. Um, it's not clear now whether the non-registration of the most popular candidates um, um, result in any further protests because we, we see this high um, wave of repressions. But it's also not clear whether the, the fact that the elections will be not free and fair, uh, which is highly possible, of course, can actually cause mass protests nationwide. And the, I think the word nationwide is quite important here because it's, it's one of the um, differences of the previous electoral campaigns that we have this protest potential also in the regions. Alexander, um, what possible scenarios do you see here when we're talking about the reaction coming from society? What can happen before or directly after the elections? And um, will these repressions, do you think they will um, kind of make people um, more aggressive and that's why more active? Or on the other hand, um, will, will they um, mostly frighten the people so that they uh, skip any political activity? And, also, um, about the long-lasting effects, uh, what would you say that this current politicization, if you, if you agree that it is, um, this wave, can it bring some, some further development of the grassroots movement of the Belarusian society, also independently of the fact if uh, the regime um, change happens um, this summer? Mm. Well, yeah, there are so many great questions. How to answer and how to predict the future. I think what normally happens is uh, that movement emerges and then it becomes, uh, well, first emotion and affective solidarity really drives it. But then, of course, this, these emotions, this affective solidarity gradually reduces its effect and over time it wades and there should be established some organizational structures, some formal structures, there should be some symbolic charismatic leaders, there should be leaders on the ground. There's so many factors and so many important things that should emerge in the coming weeks in order for this uh, process of uh, politicization of Belarusian society to be sustainable. Um, there's so many unknown that it's very hard to say what happened, but normally it feels like that uh, when contextual factors might reduce its influence, like COVID pandemic would be kind of would uh, fade away gradually, like it happened in Western European countries, or like things related to, I don't know, like summer would, <laughs> would end, maybe Russia would open its borders and many people who uh, normally go to work in Russia in summer, they couldn't do this this time, they would go. Um, and um, this process of working migration would resume, many factors, and it might really actually help to reduce the wave of this dissatisfaction. I think what happens, and what happened, for instance, three years ago after the previous wave movement in 2010, not much 2010, maybe 2006 specifically, uh, any, any this type of movement, uh, it uh, uh, resulted in, uh, so, so in new waves of migration from the country, uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, some people would join more sustainable political structures in Belarus. So I think it's now depends on uh, current people who are most prominent. Those bloggers I mentioned, uh, Babarika team, Tsipkala is now re refused to be registered. Uh, the recent, the most recent news. Um, it seems like these people should decide whether they want to organize and form something or not. What what's going to happen on the election night? Well, we can't say really, but indeed it might be that this time we see not just one plus, so not just one uh, uh, post-electoral process, but many across many localities across the town. And, and the emergence and organization being facilitated at the moment by, by the mechanisms I mentioned earlier. I hope you, I, I answered most of the, the questions you had. Um, 
we still thank you, Alexandra. We'll still have uh, the opportunity to add something because we already have um, quite a number of questions. I will try to um, maybe to summarize uh, some questions because um, um, a lot of them um, have more, um, more or less the same nature. Um, I would like to start uh, with the um, question um, on the international dimension of these elections. We have not been discussing that because it was not the topic, but of course our guests uh, and listeners are interested. We have an elephant in this room. It is named Russia, of course. And the question is about, is there a risk that Russia might intervene military? Um, militarily, sorry, in certain scenarios after the election day, um, more or less similar to what we saw in the Ukraine 2014. And I would like to link also this question to, to another one, have international dimension, is about the presence, um, the possible presence of international observers from OSCE, from the Parliamentary Assembly and Council of Europe and so on, and also international media that um, due to COVID might not be invited or might not be able to come um, to Belarus during this time. And uh, what, uh, what do you think the implications could be? Um, Mm -hmm. During the final stage of election campaign, um, who would monitor the process and perhaps contribute to a mitigation of conflicts between the government and its opponents, including um, civil society activists? So uh, how do you estimate um, the influence uh, of, of the lack of this international element, the possible lack uh, during this election? So the first one in Russia, the second one on international observers and journalists. And I would say whoever wants to answer whatever question, just make a choice. Who'd like to start? Well, I'll probably start with Russia. Uh, I think that actually right now, right now, Russia has a very good position because it's not supposed to do anything with Belarus because Lukashenko will repress like a huge part of Belarusian society. After that, the West will have to sanction Lukashenko in is on this or another way, but it seems that repressions as well as sanctions probably inevitable. So and after that, after that, Alexander Lukashenko will have to negotiate with Russia again in autumn because Belarus has no money and he right now Belarus cannot receive anything from the IMF or cannot receive significant funds from the EU. And so Russia is not supposed to do anything right now. It just has to wait and in a way enjoy the process and uh, to see how Belarus actually deprives itself of an opportunities to build normal relations with the West. Yeah, probably should I, should I answer the second question? If you wish. I I just leave it up. Well, I, I can I can ask, so no problem. Well, I guess that actually it's the first election when no one really cares about international observers. It's very, very odd, but actually people even don't talk about that. Probably it in a way shows that actually Belarus in a position finally has a great support. That is why there is less talks about how the West should help us and how the West should help us to survive. So I think that, of course, it's a problem that they will not arrive. Of course, it's, uh, it will make Belarus elections less transparent. By the end of the day, they were not transparent even before, even with international observers. So I guess, of course, it's bad, but well, it's not so bad as you can expect. Thank you, Alexandra. Would you like to add um, anything? Well, I perhaps just add about election as someone who'd been organizing uh, election observation previously in Belarus. Just what I would like to say, perhaps, is that uh, uh, many people still believe who live in Belarus that elections do happen and votes being counted while it might be not really true, my experience suggests it's not true. Which means that, uh, well, even in observers who've been observing Belarusian elections for many years, international observers of domestic, really never helped anyhow to change it. And I don't see how they would change it this time. 
So it's really, it doesn't really influence domestic policy, whether they're present or not. I think uh, what we uh, see, and very interesting, another uh, aspect of this movement I talked about, it, collective action, it's not just about street protest, right? There are many forms of collective action can emerge. And one of the collective action is, uh, one of the forms of collective action is participating in election observation or election monitoring. And I think many, many new people now join in this type of election monitoring across the country. So it might be another kind of dimension where this movement would find it, it, it way to, to find some organizational form. So it's, uh, we don't need maybe those international observers that much. We need more domestic observers and they seems coming in. Um, thank you. Um, I have here a short question about, I think it, it goes more or less um, um, direction um, the elites and uh, security forces. Um, how would you estimate the influence of security officers protesting online and showing their support for the protest movement and stability of the regime? Um, uh, so we've seen, or maybe before you just um, give us a picture of what is meant here, all these pictures that we, anonymous pictures that we We've seen online um, of some insiders from security officers that seem to uh, show support to the broader public. In how far do you have the feeling it is widespread there and in how far can it be dangerous for the institution? Well, it's kind of difficult to speak about the online pictures, but generally, I guess the mood of many not many of some people in the security services is that they do not want to be a part of the oppression system and as it was for example it 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 was a great news i guess like a week ago that actually four interrogators declined like uh, to be interrogators on tikhanovsky's case so it shows that actually not so many people in the system would like to be uh, to be instrumental during the repressions. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, I think that there are a few people inside the system who really would like to have massive repressions. And it's very useful for them to use repressions to, to receive more power inside the system. Because as we see, for example, in the case of this government's reshuffle, there are no, like almost, well, there are some technocrats inside the system, but there are too many people from the security agencies. And they're very happy that they have now more power. They can do like, not whatever they want, but they can do a lot of things. And they now control the financial streams of the state. So I think that, in the middle level or in the lower level, many people in the security agencies are not satisfied, but at the same time, top level Silaviki, they, they see these massive repressions as actually an opportunity to show that they are great and they have a great position inside the system. Well, we can take, for example, this meeting of the EU ambassadors uh, that took place uh, in the Belarusian MFA just, I guess, 10 days ago, and which was like attended by the uh, chairman of the state control co committee, who is actually investigating the case of Viktor Babarika. And he presented himself as a boss, although the minister of foreign affairs, who was the boss of the meeting, was like uh, sitting not quietly, but he, he was definitely number two inside this room. So I guess that that shows that Silaviki will use this opportunity to show that they are very important to Lukashenko and later they will show, like, use this power in their economic or political interests. Thank you. Alexandra, do you have any anything uh, you would like to add here or we should go further? Um, now I would like to take some, um, let me say, uh, I just missed this question just a 
second. Okay. Um, a female dimension uh, of our discussion. Um, uh, one of the listeners tells us that we've been discussing mostly uh, male candidates. Um, Tsikhanovska and Konopatskaya um, um, figure more in the shadow. So despite the letter given, um, the letter given a very confident interview yesterday um, stating that she would not act as a spoiler for Belarus. And the question is, what are the chances? And maybe you just can give us a bit more information who those women are, who's Konopatska and who's Tsikhanovska, who has actually, who, who actually, the, well, the letter, she, she didn't actually plan to take part in the elections, right? She is uh, uh, only a woman of the uh, well-known um, YouTube blogger uh, uh, who spontaneously um, decided to, to candidate for elections after Tikhanovsky was not registered. So it's also a very interesting um, phenomenon in Belarus that um, a woman who is hardly known to anybody, um, if you watch the interviews of people on this um, live stream seen in the queues, most of them, quite a lot of them, okay, not most, but quite a lot of them didn't ever even know where she was working, right? So they gave her these signatures out of protest and out of support. And she, at least, she stated that she managed to to, to gather more than uh, 100,000 uh, signatures. So, um, how do you see the role of these two women in politics that we have right now? And in how far is it possible that Kanapatska is a spoiler candidate? Who would like, maybe Alexander, you would like to start? All right, yes. Uh, shortly, perhaps, suggest that it seems like um, we have several women running and uh, uh, the, 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 the case of uh, Tikhanovskaya, who is, who is a, a, a wife of um, uh, Mr. Tikhanovsky, who is the, the, the imprisoned blogger, is perhaps the case of, uh, of this kind of charisma that been transferred from one person to another. So there was a charismatic blogger who announced he's running and uh, suddenly he was imprisoned, couldn't be registered. So his wife said, I'm going to run. And she's running and she got essentially his charisma been spread on her and that's how she's perhaps getting attention. Case of another woman, uh, Kanapatska, she's been selected rather than elected uh, in 2000, uh, perhaps, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure the date, uh, several years ago to the parliament. Now she's not in the parliament, but she was uh, one of two representatives of, uh, of a kind of opposition organizations that um, uh, that time got, was selected to the parliament of Belarus. I think her case is is this case of um, of uh, of attitude of Lukashenko, his personal attitudes towards women, towards women politician. Uh, that I think uh, the regime and he himself perceives women is not as substantial threat to his power as man for some reason. So he's quite comfortable with women. And he indicated a couple of times that he would be, I think, comfortable running, but he definitely not anticipate the women, uh, then the, the winning elections. So it shows uh, rather uh, their presence in the, in the, if they will be selected for the final list on candidates, uh, their presence would indicate rather the stance of Lukashenko, personal stance towards women, rather than just any uh, other factors, in my opinion. Thank you, Ruhar. Would you like to add something? No. Okay. Um, it is already um, six o'clock in Berlin. Uh, we are kind of a bit out of time, but if our speakers are okay with that, I would suppose that I would suggest that uh, we have another maybe seven to eight minutes of discussion in order to give you some more questions. Um, really have to apologize. Um, we will not be able to take all the questions. Thank you for your high interest, but I will try to do what I can. Um, the next question is about the um, also very unexpected idea suggestion coming from the um, the, um, the team of Viktor Babarika about the constitution of um, referendum um, on the constitutions of 1994. Um, it was there was an idea um, after Babarika was arrested. There was a video that he uh, prepared for this case that he would be arrested and in this video he suggests that, that uh, people, um, Belarusians, um, initiate a referendum. Uh, you need about 400, if I'm not mistaken, 400, 
450, 400 something uh, thousand um, signatures for that in order to um, initiate a referendum uh, in Belarus. So the idea is to come back um, to the referendum um, on, sorry, to the constitutions um, of 94. Uh, what do you think? What do you think about this strategy? Uh, what are the aims of this uh, quite unexpected suggestion? Uh, what does the team of Babarika want to, to reach with that? We'd like to start. I'll probably start. Well, I think it's not a very bad idea uh, because in a way it's an opportunity for Babarika's team to collect, for example, half a million or a million of signatures. And that will show the, the strengths. It's an opportunity to build regional offices of his future organization, let's say. So, of course, uh, politically, it also um, a way to show that, um, that it's an opportunity to show, for example, people in elites that they also can receive something from Bobarika because this constitution from 1994 it was pretty European constitution and there was like uh, every power parliament has a real power like government has a real power uh, regional uh, city councils have more or less real power so it's a great opportunity to propose something for, for, for the elites. At the same time, I think it's, uh, well, of course, it, it's a little bit odd to propose to go back. And uh, it's a little bit, um, well, Belarusians were not happy in 1994. It's true. So people feel that they really need something new not to go back but uh, and also there is a huge question is actually what Babarika's team will do if they will bring these one million signatures to the electoral commission and the electoral commission will say no we do not accept the signatures so it's a huge challenge uh, so i think it's a double-edged sword and uh, there is no clear answer about this initiative. Yeah, I perhaps uh, would disagree here. I think it's a great idea. And I think, uh, well, obviously, uh, Rigor is co co completely right. There are many challenges and obstacles and uncertainties related to the form of what been proposed. But in terms of the nature of this, uh, idea. I think it speaks directly to the question I raised at, uh, earlier. What's next? What's going to happen next? Next day after the presidential election day? And this is an answer. It's a great answer for the supporters of those people. They say, well, we, we perhaps lost the election, but we are not lost the fight. Let's continue. The, the, let's continue and let's organize not a party, not a movement, just some kind of referendum initiative. They would, of course, seek uh, people's signatures. People's signatures would also offer an opportunity, collecting their emails, creating list of supporters, organizing them in the regions, raising uh, or organizing formal structures in the regions of the country. I think it's a great and sustainable way to continue this pre-election pre mobilization post-election. Whatever happens, uh, they would be they would get uh, they would get some co uh, continuous uh, continuous movement. That that what they need, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And as long as we're talking about the the strategy of uh, Babarika, who is one of the most should be one of the most popular presidential candidates, um, there is another question uh, suit, uh, that's used here. Um, I find it very interesting also that Babarika um, kind of, or his team kind of tries to change the narrative um, the way that, well, normally uh, the, the main message coming from the position before was that the authorities are bad, right? The authorities are bad, the elections are not free per definition. And what we see now, uh, what Babarika was telling people before he was arrested, but also his uh, team is um, doing as well now after that, 
uh, their focus is on the people. So they tell the people, the Belarusians, Belarusians, you are good, you are smart, you can manage that, you are capable of solidary actions. We are a strong nation, uh, the will of people cannot be falsified. Just follow the rules. We have the rule of law. Our state is not that undemocratic as it can seem. Um, it is quite surprising. These messages, I find, I find them to be quite new for the Belarusian reality. But at the same time, at least at the very first stage, it seems to have worked. So Babarika managed to mobilize um, almost 10,000 people in one week online with these messages, uh, with these positive messages about people and with his belief that the, the legal system of Belarus is actually functioning, you just have to, you just have to follow, you know, follow the legal, the legal rules, gather signatures and so on. So of course he understands that Belarus is not a democratic state, but he is trying kind of change the reality. I have the feeling he's trying to change the rule games, the, uh, the game rules, and to convince also those people who will be part of the electoral commissions actually to count the voices because uh, this campaign is named, for example, Honest People. Um, this, this is an online campaign that unites people who want to be part of the electoral commissions, wanted to be because the most of them were not registered, and people who want to um, be observers during the elections. And at the same time, they don't call for a protest on the streets after Babarika was detained they didn't ask people to get out of the streets because they want they want to use the maximum of this legal mechanism within the state. So how do you think, um, well, how realistic could this strategy actually be for the Belarusian reality? Do you, do you, do you see it to be reasonable or um, in the light of the recent repressions, you would say it doesn't make any sense now to mobilize people like that? Yeah. Well, I guess, we should find for an answer uh, in the case that Babarika is a very unique candidate and he is a very unique candidate because he can win electorally Lukashenko in the first round. And that creates very weird limitations for him because he understands that he in a way should follow the rules despite of all repressions against him, his son, his team, whatever. And they do not, well, in a way they can radicalize people in a day. It's not a problem. But if they will radicalize people, what they will do next with them? They, all these people will go to the prison and that's it. So in a way they just wait. And uh, it seems to be, for them, it seems to be a good strategy. But at the same time, it's important to understand that not all people think that it's a good strategy because they think that he, or well, not he, but his team right now, are telling people something very different from what is going on. For, for example, yesterday, like the Electoral Commission just killed 300,000 of his signatures saying that they're not true and that, that they not, do not, uh, that they were not prepared in the way they should be prepared. And the, the Babarika's team was saying that, well, it's not a problem, we'll see, let's follow the rules. And many people s thought at that moment that it's very strange. So I think probably it's a good idea for Babarika's team at the same time, not all people, even inside his team, actually think that, you know, that this is a good way to show their emotions. Thank you, Alexandra. Would you like to add something? Well, I don't have much to add, perhaps just to say that I don't know who, who, who can win whom in the, in, if we had free and fair election. <laughs> I think it's quite speculative to say who can win what. and. I also think that it's quite hard to mobilize people really uh, for street action in any place, in any country. Uh, so, uh, but I really like that there is some idea, some, some narrative and it's shared by people. So it's good to have new narratives. I, I really like that they came up with some new idea. Great. 
Okay, thank you for being that positive. Um, um, I think we are about to ask the last question and um, together with the answer, maybe you give, a, give us a kind of your last message um, for today. Um, what would you like uh, still, would you like to say maybe I did not have this opportunity? Um, the last question is, of course, well, we are in Germany, with, we are in the European Union. Uh, what reaction would you expect um, uh, from, the, uh, from the European Union uh, uh, in case of different scenarios in Belarus? So um, do you think as well, in how far do you think that would be imported the, 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 agenda, the Belarusian agenda for the European Union? And um, in how far would you... Um, uh, how would you estimate the possibility of the new sanctions coming for the European Union? Or you would say that the reality has changed since 2010 and uh, now we have to do some other kind of foreign policy um, um, of the European Union. And then your final message. Who would like to start? <laughs> It seems that Alessi is, is, is trying to give me an opportunity to start. Uh, okay, well, I think that the West can decrease the cost of repressions for Belarusian societies. For example, to help to pay fines, to pay for lawyer services. And of course, the West can increase the cost of repressions for the authorities. Well, I personally do not think that sector sanctions is a good policy option with Belarus. But probably Belarusian authorities just need to hear that word, word several times, just to acknowledge that the fact that West is not happy about repressions in Belarus. And also the West always can support civil society organizations and media, because without them, prospects of democratic improvements in Belarus are very unlikely. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anything as a last message for our public? Mm, no. no, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I, I hear I have not many things to say. Just, I would say that uh, it seems like this time, Belarus, elections in Belarus, one of the first few cases when it happened before that it seems like that foreign issues are not that important anymore. It seems like there are not many talks about EU, Russia, choices between EU or Russia. It seems, like, uh, it seems like people are concerned with different issues and it's likely if there are new sanctions, they might either not really, people might not really notice those sanctions or just react in an opposite way. Like uh, very often sanctions really affect majority of population. If you impose sanctions from, a, from from abroad, it helps to sort of um, highlight differences between us and them, and really it might be uh, it might be might have negative consequences for the image of the EU or the West in Belarus, in my understanding. But it's 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 something I don't can really say much about. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Rehor. Thank you very much uh, to our partners of the today's discussion, the uh, German Association for East European Studies. And um, thank you also for those guests who managed to, <laughs> to, to be with us till now. Um, um, we've uh, decided to make this discuss discussion a bit longer. I'm really sorry um, because we did manage to answer all the questions, but uh, more or less most of them. And I'm also happy to say that it should not be the last discussion in Germany for the German um, public, German speaking public, um, at least two more discussions, as long as I'm informed, uh, will take place in the upcoming weeks. So uh, please um, be updated. And uh, well, thank you once again for being with us today and have a good evening. Thank you.